A few years ago, I was employed as an IT consultant at a biochemical research office out in the middle of nowhere in East Anglia. It usually took about an hour and a half to get from where I lived out to the office, but the pay was decent so I was quite happy with the long commute. One Sunday night in late August, I got called up at quarter to twelve from my supervisor, telling me there'd been some kind of massive system-wide crash in the evening, and she needed me to come in pronto and get it sorted. I knew I'd get good compensation, so I downed two cups of coffee, hopped in my car, and headed out for the office. The drive was mainly along a motorway, although at that hour, it was almost all populated by lorries. However, a good stretch took me through a track of rural countryside, which was crisscrossed by narrow roads bordered by large hedgerows and small woods. I'll admit that it was a bit creepy driving through the desolate pastures and forests at midnight on an isolated expanse of road. Thanks to the trafficless conditions, I arrived in little under an hour, and I spent the rest of the night debugging, fueled by copious amounts of coffee and Red Bull. Finally, I was done by about 4.30 in the morning, by which time I was all too happy to be heading home and get some shut-eye. I stepped into my car, and I waved goodbye to the security man, who, apart from my supervisor, was the only other occupant of the building at the time. I was setting off, just as the sky was starting to turn that deep, early morning blue, and the air was beginning to be filled with birdsong. I passed out of the office park, where the building was located, and had crossed over into the dense bockage of the country. I did my best trying to stay alert, and I kept my eye on the winding road, which now seemed to be even emptier than it had been when I drove up. But after about 20 minutes, my car sputtered to a stop. I yawned and checked the tank. It was still half full. I glanced at the clock. It read five minutes to five. I quietly swore to myself. This was just about the worst possible place to break down and my tech expertise doesn't exactly cover car engines. I switched on my old flip phone and I was surprised and damn thankful that I had any service. I made the call to AA and gave them my location, telling the operator that I had broken down. They said someone would be out as soon as possible, probably within an hour. I was extremely tired but I decided to keep myself awake by getting out into the fresh morning air. It was getting lighter, and the surrounding landscape was bathed in the morning blue, but I estimated it would still be an hour before the sun came up. Lighting up a cigarette, I stood there smoking against my car for a few minutes, quietly surveying the topography of the land. My part of the road was sandwiched between a small copse and a field bordered by tall hedges that rose into a slight hill, topped with a large tree. The road ahead was on an incline, so I couldn't see much beyond where it crested at the top. Through the trees of the copse, I could make out the shape of what appeared to be an old arms cottage, although I think it must have been abandoned. It can't have been more than about a minute after I'd put out my cigarette when I saw a dim yellow light, which I assumed was from a low battery flashlight approaching from the road ahead and led by three dark figures. I stood upright and I squinted into the darkness, thinking that they were perhaps masochistic joggers or farm labourers heading off for work. However, as the silhouettes got closer and became clearer, I saw that they were not holding flashlights at all, but rather old-fashioned lanterns 
with wicks burning away in small glass boxes. As they approached, I got a look at them in the morning light, and by the way they were dressed, I thought they must be going to some kind of reenactment or something. One of them was a policeman, but instead of wearing a high-vis vest and a heavy belt, he was dressed as an old village constable, with a black uniform and shiny buttons, and with an honest-to-God silver whistle chain dangling out of his pocket. Another was in the garb of a farmer, with a tweed suit and a flat cap, and he seemed to be holding something heavy. As he got closer, I realized that it was a double-barreled shotgun, which made me more than a little nervous. I couldn't get a good look at the last one, not until they came right up to me, as he was in all black. But as soon as I glimpsed his collar, I realized that he must have been a vicar. As they approached me, I could see by their eyes that they were all terrified. The constable spoke first. Pardon, sir, but have you seen a lass in white come down this way? He spoke in broad Norfolk, and he seemed overly formal in his address. Um, no, sorry. Is something wrong? At that, they turned to each other. Reverend? said the man in tweed. The vicar seemed deep in contemplation. If she hasn't come along the road, then she'll be miles away by now, said the constable. Nonsense. She couldn't possibly get out over the fence before dawn, declared the man in tweed, looking towards the vicar, although he said nothing in response. We'd need a bloody aeroplane to catch her now, George. There's no chance she hasn't gotten away. This solemn declaration was followed by a moment of awkward silence. Not unless she went into the wood, the reverend said eventually. Well, that's it then. Come on, said the farmer, motioning towards the cops. I won't go in there, George, and that gun of yours won't do naught to save us, and I reckon you know it too, reverend. If she gets away, then it's on our hands, said the vicar quietly. Let's just pray we find her before daybreak. The constable nodded gravely, and the trio turned towards the small group of trees. Can I be of any help? I finally asked. Although, to be honest, I was afraid of saying anything. It didn't matter though as the vicar slowly turned and looked towards me as if he had heard a very soft noise. It was as if they could no longer see me at all. I was at once glad and terrified. With that, the three of them trudged off, and I watched as the ghostly procession crossed over the low dry stone wall bordering the copse, and with the vicar leading them, they disappeared into the trees. I stood still against my car, trying to figure out what the hell had just happened. But after a few minutes, I came to the conclusion that, in my sleep-deprived state, I must have begun to hallucinate. Although, I reasoned that nothing like that had ever happened to me before. My eyes kept on drooping, so I lit up another cigarette, and I decided to walk up the adjacent field which was bordered by a bridleway that led up the knoll. I crossed over a narrow footbridge and followed up the side of the field until I reached the large oak tree that stood on the hilltop. From here, I surveyed the landscape hidden by the ridge, which was all broad fen country, crisscrossed with hedgerows, sunken streams and canals. From my view on the slight promontory, I could not make out a single hamlet, farmstead or grain silo for miles. There was a remarkable absence of any sign of human habitation. I was suddenly struck with just how bizarre it was that these three men must have been trekking for miles in the dark, 
with only the dim light of their lanterns. By then, I was sure that they must have been real, for I could very clearly picture their worried and haggard faces in my mind. Something odd I noticed was that the trees that bordered the side of the road, which I thought had made up a small copse, seemed to stretch out a good ways further and consisted of a considerable track of dense woodland, now lit up by the red sky of the early dawn. I couldn't quite reconcile this in my mind, as I distinctly remembered stopping on the side of the road and glancing at the old alms cottage through the thin tree line. Now, the trees enveloped the land, and the cottage was nowhere to be seen. Just then, I heard a very distant but very discernible crack, which I immediately realized must have been a gunshot. I put out my cigarette just as the tip of the sun crested on the horizon, and I took one last glance westward before heading down. When I spotted something, coming towards me from the other side of the hill. There was a distant white figure bounding up the bridleway at quite a pace. I can't quite describe the sensation, but I suddenly felt oppressively tired. My vision blurred, and I was struck by a sharp headache, similar to the feeling you get when you stand up too quickly. This was accompanied by a feeling of unrelenting and biting dread. As my head cleared, I watched the white shape draw nearer. It almost appeared to be limping and running at once. I believed at the time that the strange figure was a woman, for I could see long, black hair fluttering against the wind. I vainly shouted to see if she was alright but I was met with no reply. The unknown woman in white only continued bounding up the bridleway, seemingly faster than before. I was now increasingly worried, and I looked around for any sign of the three strangers I had met not five minutes ago, or, indeed, anyone in the surrounding countryside. As it was, I was alone with this stranger charging towards me in her unsettling hobble. I decided I would feel safer in my car, and I turned around to walk back down the hill when what was, without a doubt, the most sickening noise I've ever heard sounded from behind me. I can't say it was a scream, for I swear it could not have been within the range of any human voice and it was more akin to a kettle coming to a boil. But this benign analogy was far from my mind when the wail resounded over the fields. It brimmed with an unrelenting rage and red-hot fury, although behind this, it was clear that the noise was wholly rooted in an irrepressibly dejected and desolate suffering. Whatever had made that sound was so fierce and frenzied and alone that I had no doubt I would have met an awful end had I not taken off running down that hill. Before I fled, I hurriedly looked back in terror. And there it was. Not twenty feet away. I knew then that it was an impossible distance to have closed in the two seconds that had elapsed since I had first heard its wail. But there it was, half limping, the speed of an Olympian. I ran, I ran like I had never run before, and as I raced down that bridleway, I heard that noise a second time, and once more, before I reached the hedgerow that bordered the road. By then, I could hear it moving on the ground, its uneven steps heaving it forward at an unnaturally fast pace. I leapt over the footbridge and I ran out into the road, nearly out of breath, and now with the awful realization that I could not outrun my pursuer. Just as I reached my car, I heard the hum of a distant engine 
and I hurriedly looked up the road, where a dark shape was crossing the distant horizon. As I shaded my eyes from the sun, I caught a glimpse of the flashing yellow emergency lights of a double-A repair vehicle descending the road ahead. I spun around, expecting to be confronted by that dreadful, limping white figure, but the road was empty. I was alone. Incredulous, I looked up at the hill, scanning the fields for any trace of the woman in white. I found none. Ten minutes later, I was sitting in the passenger seat of the tow truck, listening to the AA repairman going on about the advantages of an early morning shift. Somehow, the banality of my situation seemed utterly ridiculous. The adrenaline was still coursing through me, and needless to say, I didn't sleep until the following evening. Just as we departed that stretch of road, we both heard a barely audible gunshot. The repairman remarked that it must be rabbit hunters, but I remained silent. As the truck crested the ridgeline, I glanced back towards the hill, and I caught sight of a piece of white fabric stuck in the oak tree, and I watched as it wrestled itself free with the breeze and fluttered off towards the sunrise.